Salutations, respective viewers. I am George from Ireland. So this video will be about the American Revolution, since um, one of my numberless uh, faithful viewers asked me to to do a piece on it. Um, the other thing is I've got I've got a sore throat, as you may have deduced from the sound of me and all the rest of it. So um, kindly make allowances for that. Uh, well, now, some of you will have figured out from where I do most of my videos from that I am resident in a city that most of you will have heard of, London. Um, and obviously, it had a, the American Revolution had a great effect on this city, as well as the British Isles more, more broadly. And um, well, some Londoners were in favour of it. London was obviously intimately involved, obviously, for the most part, trying to suppress the revolution. But um, uh, Benjamin Franklin um, uh, lived in London for several years. And indeed, I filmed a video outside his house, which is which is open to the public. You can go in there. I went there only inside only once, but that's absolutely um, donkey's years ago. And um, there was a, there was an actress and she was doing a show on it, a one woman show on it. They didn't have, wouldn't it be more apposite to have someone playing him? But there we go. But she was speaking to a recorded voice that was speaking back. Anyway, <clears throat> so the American Revolution, I can't assume a foreknowledge on, on behalf of my viewers and listeners, because some of you might not be uh, particularly clued up on the American Revolution. I, I don't know a great deal about it, as the next few minutes shall doubtless reveal. Um, well, obviously, 1776 is, is, is the crucial year. I shan't give you too much of the backstory. Um, anyway, in 1607, Jamestown, Virginia had been founded, probably going too far back, in honour of King James I of England, King of Ireland. He was also King of Scots. So English immigrants and Welsh immigrants went over there. Obviously, soon Scots and Irish immigrants. The Irish people going were, were Protestants to begin with, almost without exception. Although the Protestant community in Ireland, 17th century, um, in Ireland, they usually didn't regard themselves as being Irish because they didn't speak the Irish language. Um, well, um, they, they mainly regard themselves as being English and Scots, um, whence their ancestors had come from Scotland and England only a few generations before in the most case most cases so anyway 13 colonies were, were gradually established on the eastern seaboard of what we now call the united states um and 1619 some um, unfortunate africans were abducted um uh, in their home continent and uh, shipped across the atlantic in ghastly conditions and forced to labor under the lash so they toiled under the brawling sun for many hours and they weren't paid so much as a groat um, for the sweat of their brow, and were, were treat, really treated abominably. And um, really, that's the astonishing thing, especially if you contrast it with the civil rights movement of the 1950s and 1960s. White Americans in 1776 had far less to complain about than African Americans in the 1950s. We were often told that uh, the use of force by white Americans in 1776 was entirely warranted. Whereas in the 1950s, for African Americans to use even the slightest force in self-defense would have been unjustified. So some white nationalists would um, have us believe. Um, so in the Southern colonies, well, cotton became king, but really only after our period when Eli Whitney invented the, the cotton gin, which, which made um, the production of it, well, much, much faster, well, processing of it, really not growing it. So various cash crops, that tobacco, sugar, um, advertise my schedule, Someone says I should advertise my schedule uh, a few hours. Well, yes, I'm not terribly organized. I like to ad lib, as um, you have surely observed, because I'm a great man for spontaneity. Don't believe in things being over rehearsed. Just go for it. A bit like when I you know, do various languages and, and jump around. I'm all for thinking on my feet. That's why I love debating. Um, so um, I shan't tell you too much about slavery. But so these these 13 colonies up and down the coast. Um, hello, Libby. Um, thank you, SAC Media One. And um, they often had a house of burgesses, or they had various other names for it in certain colonies, as in a legislature. A burgess <laughs> was somebody who owns substantial real property. It was related to the French word bourgeois, as in, as in middle class. Um, so the, the franchises and the right to vote was very restricted only to males um, who owned a lot of real property. Um, uh, so and some people are intermarried with, with, with Native Americans. Sometimes this was accepted. It's such a long time period. And so geographically diffuse, it's difficult to uh, generalize. Um, so uh, people talk about there being religious liberty in the United States. 
I'm not quite so sure about that because Maryland was specifically for Catholics and they're mostly Protestant colonies. So they're often the people who shifted over a war from people who were outside the established churches in Ireland, the Church of Ireland in Scotland, the Church of Scotland, and in England, the Church of England. So Protestants outside those ones would be Baptists, Quakers, um, um, and in times Methodists, um, or obviously Catholics, we're not Protestants, but we're outside those churches. Not very many Catholics went. And indeed there was anti-Catholic prejudice in America. Because if you look at what was said about the the um, uh, the, the so-called Boston Massacre, I think it's John Ad Adams, the defense attorney, as in he was he was um, courageously advocating for the British soldiers in that case. Um, he uh, mentioned tags being on the side, tag being a um, derogatory term for an Irish Catholic. The Irish language word tada, if I pronounce it correctly, meaning native or possibly um, uh, derived from um, the Irish word, um, the Irish name taig which was quite a popular boy's name. Um, anyway, so there's also a tiny Jewish um, communion as well. Um, so yeah, various legislatures. So each colony being in a direct relationship with London, um, but not with each other, although obviously that was to change. So then people from outside the British Isles came in. There always been Dutch. No, um, the Boston Massacre, not by Irish Catholics, really. There were some P Irish Catholics there, but John Adams was trying to use it in defense of the soldiers, saying, well, there were these bad guys there, including Tagues. Now, I wouldn't usually say that word because it's opprobrious, but I'm just quoting him. Um, because unless you're from Ireland or, or Scotland, you wouldn't know that word. In fact, it was in Scotland, one of our first saw it, about 11, seeing F the Tagues graffiti eyes. Well, I shan't bodlerize it. Fuck the Tagues, someone had written. Because just being one of those people myself, I didn't take very much umbrage at it. I've only once in my life been called that to my face. Um, anyway, uh, where was I getting? So most, most people were farmers, of course, a little bit of industry starting, some whaling. But there were, there were Dutch people in New York to begin with. That has to be been New Amsterdam. And um, uh, that's why Stoysafant, one of the early Dutch mayors of it, lends his name to various things in New York to this day. There were some Swedes, some Germans. Very few people from other parts of the world who were there. So there were plenty of African-Americans in the southern uh, colonies, a few in the northern ones. So um, so pretty soon everybody's English speaking. Well, you know, the Dutch people often kept their language going well into the 19th century. Um, so uh, various um, conflicts, the Seven Years' War, or we call it in Europe, or the French and Indian War, as the, as the Americans call it. Anyway, so there's that bruising war against France ending in in in. in, in 1764, a multi-continental war. Um, well, the, the they had as loyalty to Britain, well, certainly some of them, as we're going to see, about of those who were involved in the conflict in the 1770s, about a third were, were loyalists and about two thirds were revolutionaries. Obviously, plenty of people were neutral. So it's estimated that sort of 40 percent really did not participate at all in the conflict. Um, anyway, so France was defeated in this multi-continental um, conflict. It was pluricontinental because it was fought obviously in the American continent and in Asia and in Africa. Well, not very much in Africa, just a tiny bit on the coast um, in Europe. Um, anyway, so the, 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 so the United Kingdom's national debt had been hu hugely run up. So the, the population of the 13 colonies was only about two and a half million um, at the time. Obviously, more people were moving over. And people did have a wider degree of, of liberty there because I'm um, usually not sort of paying tithes to an established church. So some uh, religious fundamentalists could found their communities there. Hello, Nicola Graham. They're, they're, they're utopian communities there. So in order to pay off this debt, tax was going to be raised. And indeed, income tax in the United Kingdom was an innovation at, at that time to try and cope with this. And well into the 19th century, William Ewart Gladstone regarded it as, a, as an unnecessary novelty, well, an undesirable novelty, which he would rather do away with, but no one had quite got round to managing to uh, cope without um, levying income tax. Um, in the midst of that Seven Years' War, um, the British Parliament passed a declaratory act, that was in 1760, stating that Westminster was entitled to pass legislation for um, the, the 13 colonies jointly, or indeed severally, in, 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 in um, 1720 over the Woods Halfpence case. London had passed a similar de declaratory act in relation to Ireland. Um, anyway, so uh, people in the 13 colonies, as they then were, 
uh, did not elect any members to uh, the British Parliament. So some Americans began to regard it as um, inequitable that they could be legislated for and indeed taxed by a parliament which they didn't have any representation. Now, of course, most Americans had no representation in their own legislatures in each colony. Only a minority of white males were permitted to vote and no, no women, no um, African-Americans. So taxation, that representation was, was, was the norm there as it was everywhere else. But you might say, oh, yes, but um, as a white male, other white males represent me, even though I'm not allowed to vote myself. Or the rich white men, well, they're also voting for the women and for the African-Americans and for the Native Americans. Well, if it seems like bunkum, well, that's because it is. So the Reverend uh, Jonathan Mayhew is the one who coined the phrase, hello there, Mrs. G, coined the phrase, no taxation without representation, the bumper sticker of Washington, D.C. to this day. It's a rich irony that um, the capital of the United States is in that very situation to this day. So um, anyway, taxes were imposed upon the colonies and people who um, advocated for these impositions said that um, uh, the Americans, they um, benefit from the protection offered them by, by the, the British uh, Army and the Royal Navy and um, saying, well, their ancestors had set sail from these shores, knowing this is the deal, they would still be legislated for by Westminster. And so they accepted that tacitly and this is, accept this is passed on to their progeny. Um, a thin argument, it strikes me. Um, anyway, but but previously, Americans hadn't had to pay any tax for the services of the British military. So why now? I suppose because the tax was just so high, the debt was just so high. So uh, tax was seldom direct in those days, usually indirect. Why, why, why um, is it a thin argument? Um, goodness, because I don't think we have to be held to these agreements that our ancestors supposedly made a long time before, and most people weren't politically conscious uh, in this earlier 1607. Anyway, there was widespread smuggling in America um, to avoid these taxes, as there was widespread smuggling in the British Isles. Taxes were often on imports and exports, so there have been window taxes and things like that, um, not taxes and income so much, so much, which is difficult to assess. And some people were just living by a barter economy and had, didn't have approval of income. You know, a lot of people didn't know to deal with cash that much. A lot of people didn't have bank accounts. Even they did have cash. Cash is fairly easy to hide. So customs and excise officers, that perennial bugbear of the libertarian, uh, these people were hired to um, apprehend smugglers and to uh, force people to cough up, pay taxes on imports and exports. So they, they were unpopular. Um, obviously, they were unpopular in Ireland and uh, in Great Britain, uh, where they often had tax on whiskey. Ireland, of course, we weren't part of the United Kingdom at the time not till New Year's Day, 1801. So <laughs> the crucial period, George of that name, the third, was ruling. Um, he ascended to the throne in 1760 at the age of one and 20. Um, so um, Parliament uh, retained the right to veto laws passed by American legislatures. Um, anyway, so uh, apparently he did block a law by an American legislature, but I can't remember which one it was. So he was starting to grow um, disliked. And by the way, you might not realise this, he was um, at sometimes deeply detested in the United Kingdom. Sometimes his public appearances, he'd be met with deathly silence. And sometimes by catcalls, jeering and hissing. Um, oh, the Ulster Scots spearheaded the rebellion, yeah. Or oh, the Scotch Irish, as they were known, and because they didn't sort of talk about that Ulster thing until well into the nineteenth <clears throat> century. I know Ulster's been around as a province for millennia, but there wasn't a so-called Ulster identity as we'd understand it today until till much later. So they say Scots Irish um, because in many cases their ancestors had come from Scotland a century before they moved to America. Well, anyway. Um, so um, paying off the debts, the Parliament passed a stamp act about about uh, having to get a stamp on legal documents. But, you know, most countries do that. Does the United States do that today? Probably it does. So this is met with ferocious protests in America, people howling about it. So Parliament backed down and scrapped that one. So it had been um, had given in to, to, to public pressure. So there are lots of taxes people don't like today in the United States. It wouldn't mean a revolution is acceptable. Then there was a Townshend Act, uh, Act in 1767, which um, put taxes on certain items that were brought to America. And some of these things which were which had previously been taxed, such as glass, paint, paper, tea, 
things which couldn't be ma made in America usually. Now later, obviously, they developed the ability to make these things themselves. And so many Americans um, drank tea because they were following British culture. So I suppose back then they would regard being British and being American as being compatible. And they're just an unusual sort of type of British person because they were very much on the edge of the Western world, very small in population, very new, lacking in self-assurance. So some Americans tried not to buy anything from the United Kingdom. The tea was usually coming from India or occasionally from China, <clears throat> but on the ships of the Honorable East India Company. So some people in, in America felt they'd be mistreated by the mother country, as they may well have then called Great Britain. So Parliament had relented once again over the Townshend Act, repealing it in 1770 on everything except for tea. Um, so that was a face saver. I remember in American school when I was little, and the teacher said, well, da -da -da, because English people drink tea. Now, George, you're Irish. Do your parents drink tea? I said, well, they do a lot, actually. Um, so, but uh, the, the, the repeal of most of the Townshend Act also maintain the principle that Parliament was entitled to impose taxes on America. Um, so the situation, well, it might be seen as comparable to those those states in, in, in free association with the United States, some of those Pacific ones, the Mariana Islands, is it American Samoa, a few of the others, maybe, 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 um, maybe Puerto Rico. So uh, perhaps as analogous. And can Congress legislate for them? Well, they reliant on, on the United States for defense and foreign affairs. So similar uh, situation. Anyway, so in 1773, the UK let some tea into America tax free. Um, so the idea was a, a boost of the coffers of the East India Company. Now, some American uh, merchants were irate about this. Why were they incandescent with rage? Because a tax free tea would be cheaper than the tea they were allowed to sell. So some Americans boarded a certain ship in Boston um, having dressed as as Native Americans to emphasize that they were not British and they, they threw the tea into the into Boston Harbor, the so-called Boston Tea Party. Um, anyway, so uh, this was uh, remember, this was a protest against lowering tax, not raising it and often it was by smugglers. So it was not as high minded as we're often led to led to believe. I mean, you'll, you'll hear a certain nationalistic myth and then the, the true story is usually not quite so edifying. So an anti-tax rebellion. I, I detest tax and do everything I can to minimize my tax liability. Then governments usually should spend less, not more. Anyway, so in 1770, a uh, furious crowd, or some would call them mob, protested about tax in Boston. Um, now, supposedly the soldiers have been subject to provocations. I'm not sure if there been, if there'd been any sort of altercation. But anyway, they opened fire. And three Americans died immediately, two died subsequently. This was dubbed the Boston Massacre. Is five people being killed enough to call it a massacre? Um, I don't think so. It's, it's rather, rather a small number. Now, I don't want people to be killed unnecessarily. Obviously, one should only use force in self-defense. Was, was it a proportionate use of force? Well, a Boston jury found that it was not murder. And so John Adams, even though he was later to be, well, president of the United States indeed, and a, a, a crucial figure in the revolution. He had the moral courage to defend these soldiers, even though he was inclined to reject British authority. Um, so he wasn't gonna take it out on these ordinary squaddies. Um, so they uh, they got some conviction, for, I think it was for manslaughter to be branded in the th thumb. So a mild uh, punishment and applaud the jurors for um, setting aside what presumably were their political opinions and um, wisely and bravely imposing a sentence proportionate with the degree of wrongdoing. Um, so Adams did believe that um, these privates should not be forced to suffer for um, injustices committed by the king and parliament of which they had no control. Anyway, there were other long-term grievances which have been going on like land hunger moving to the West um, because various uh, treaties had been signed with the Native American tribes, or should we call them nations, agreeing not to go further west. Um, and so some uh, landless uh, uh, white American said, we want to move further west. I don't care about the Native Americans, just drive them off the land. They are savages, as the, the Declaration of Independence says, saying that they had no title to their property, they had no document. So the king had made these treaties through his intermediaries with uh, the Native American chieftains. 
And uh, the British government did not want these treaties ripped up, as some colonists did, because they said, if we do, well, then they'll be fighting against them. That's going to cost us more money. Um, uh, the French will be irate. Um, the French um, have been driven out of Canada, but they still had Louisiana. And if we go further west, we'll eventually bump into them. Louisiana back then was not as Louisiana is now. Louisiana then was enormous. And remember, if France hadn't sold that, the Louisiana Purchase, if that had not taken place, history would have been very different. France, even having lost the Napoleonic Wars, if it, you know, when it recovered to make the most of its American <laughs> empire, then things would have been very different. Um, anyway, yes, the Ulster Scots are very loyal to the crown, so says <laughs> SWBP. Um, so uh, what's the next thing? Um, so there was some disturbance. And so London said, we must govern America more firmly because of this rising tide of uh, agitation and sedition. So some laws were passed, later dubbed um, the Intolerable Acts by the, by the revolutionists. Um, so these were deeply unpopular, particularly in, in, in Massachusetts, which seemed to be the seat of firebrand revolutionary activity. Um, so uh, Massachusetts was particularly troublesome. So um, London said, you're not entitled to have a legislature any longer. Um, and that um, his Britannic Majesty would appoint all the officials. Now, each colony had a governor, but he was appointed by the king, not elected by the people in those days. So um, anyway, so there were laws which um, removed the right of an American to be tried by a jury from that colony. And uh, the port of Boston was, was shut until such time as Boston paid a fine for the Boston Tea Party. Now, a bit unfair to penalise the whole city, collective punishment, because only a handful of guys who did it, but they couldn't be identified. They were never caught. Um, uh, right. So anyway, um, um, Americans were forced to take British soldiers into their homes. They were billeted on them, were required to feed them um, out of pocket. A very common thing going on in Europe well into the 20th century. So anyway, in 1774, um, so um, Americans from all the Baker's dozen of colonies met in Philadelphia, the aptly named city as in brotherly love, and they formed the first Continental Congress. Continental because it was just of the American continent, only those whole, those, those 13 colonies, not of Canada, not of the countries all the way down to Tierra del Fuego, but to emphasize therefore of that continent, not Europe, so not the British Isles. And this Congress said, well, we've got to discuss how we're going to react to the intolerable acts because, well, they're unacceptable, as their name suggests. They formed um, a group of armed men, a militia, so part-time soldiers doing ordinary jobs. And so when there'd been war wars against France, um, some Americans had volunteered for the militia. They weren't professional soldiers, just hastily trained, fighting alongside British regulars. George Washington was one of them, and voluntarily taking an oath of loyalty to his most gracious majesty, George III. Anyway, so uh, the British government was worried about this militia. And what are they planning? Now, many Americans owned guns, obviously they owned muskets back in those days. A lot of people in the United Kingdom owned guns. There was almost no law well uh, regulating these things. Um, so people said, well, we need them to fight, the people on the frontier were fighting against African-Americans, particularly to terrorize African-Americans so they can't have freedom. Um, and also people were just went hunting for the pot or they were out in the woods and there were dangerous beasts like bears. Um, so um, the uh, British governor decided, well, I better confiscate this store of gunpowder at um, Concord, um, or do I pronounce it correctly as a Concord? And so 900 soldiers sent to Concord to, to do just that. So the American um, uh, militia heard of this and decided, well, we won't allow them to do this. We're gonna stop the army seizing the gunpowder. It was a shot hurled, hurled around the world. Um, OK, so I won't go through um, everything else about um, what happened at um, Le <coughs> Lexington Green. They say the generals are always fighting the, 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 the last war. I'm not going to recount the whole tale of the American Revolution, but these are some of the um, origins of it. And um, it was it was an advance for, for, for human liberty and that greater freedom of expression was allowed. And um, Congress shall no, pass no law about uh, religion which is fantastic, but that was Congress, the federal government, states could do it, and the states did do it for decades. Various states had a state church, like the Episcopalian church usually. Presumably that meant those of other religious denominations were discriminated against. So you're setting a, a good 
um, framework for government, um, although obviously the constitution didn't come until 1788. And after the United States became independent, most people don't know this, there was no president to begin with. There, there was a president of um, uh, the Senate, but not president of the United States. And he changed every few weeks. There was only a president from the United States from 1789, if I got that right. Um, and so the, remember the, so there was there were the Articles of Confederation um, to make sure the United States functioned. So it, was a, it was a looser structure, more of a confederation than a, than a federation. But even that said that it was perpetual union. So uh, I know when the American Civil War came along, the southern states, when they broke away from the United States, they said, well, we chose to join the United States. We retain the right to leave it at any time. You could argue no, because you signed perpetual union, which means you, if you change your mind, you're not permitted to leave. Um, but that's another issue. The, it was probably the hypocrisy of the North. If it's acceptable for you to break away from the British Empire, why is it unacceptable for the South to break away from the United States? Now, I know there's slavery, but that's not why the Civil War was actually fought. I know slavery is an absolute abomination, and anything which, which brought it, its end one day closer is to be welcomed. But as Lincoln shouted from the rooftops a thousand times, the war is not about slavery. He just wanted to maintain the Union. Um, so that's just a little bit about uh, the American Revolution, and it had a major impact in Ireland. The Irish Volunteers were founded, not like the Irish Volunteers today, they were very much royalist in those days, but wanting legislative independence for Ireland. Uh, and indeed that happened. Now, the American Revolution, we know it succeeded, but it came quite close to being snuffed out at Valley Forge. Uh, George Washington's men were in parlous conditions, so many of them ill. There was desertion and the British Army had advanced. They might have finished off the revolution, but they, they failed to take that golden opportunity. Only after the Battle of Saratoga, when France, Spain, and Denmark, uh, sorry, the Netherlands saw that the war was going very badly for uh, the United Kingdom, did they declare war on the court of St. James? Um, because they realized this, this revolt was not going to be quelled easily, that um, John Bull had his hands full, and so they could easily cause the UK a lot of trouble around the world. And that's why the United Kingdom couldn't commit every last man to America, because they had to be strong elsewhere to guard against the possibility of an invasion by France. Had it not been for that, would the revolution have been defeated? Quite possibly, maybe a stalemate, a compromise. And there are many people in the UK who are advocating compromise. Well, Edmund Burke, Charles James Fox, some of the more advanced Whigs, and they're obviously royalists in America. And they're moderates on the revolutionary side of the Olive Branch Petition, who thought that maybe they could avert a complete split if significant concessions were made, avoid fighting. And obviously there was no guarantee that uh, the, um, the revolutionaries were going to prevail. And even they had the cost could have been much, much higher. Well, that's been my, my penny's worth on the American Revolution. I shan't speak about it all night. Make sure you follow me on Twitter, on Instagram, on Facebook, and book me as your tour guide in London. Choose me for online lessons in any humanity subject, French and law. All right. Cheery bye bye.